Hello, everyone, and let us start. Um, it gives me great pleasure uh, to welcome everyone to the fifth seminar uh, in the meetings with the Psalms and uh, Psalter series. <clears throat> the seminar is co-sponsored by the Nanovic Institute for European Studies at the University of Notre Dame in the US, represented by Professor Magdalena harzyńska wojcik and um, the University of Warsaw in Poland, to be more specific, the research group for the study of manuscripts, Siglum at the University of Warsaw. My name is Monika Opalinska and I represent the letter. Uh, Professor harzyńska wojcik uh, cannot join us today and she asked me to extend her apologies for her absence to everyone. Those of you who were here um, last month uh, will remember that Professor Yuri Desplenta uh, from the University of Ghent uh, talked about the oldest Middle Dutch translations of the Psalms. Today we are going to remain in the Low Countries, but we will redirect our attention to from Middle Dutch to Old English via a fragmentary lost Psalter that found its way to the Netherlands. Professor Thijs Pork who is our guest speaker today, is a lecturer of medieval English at the Leiden University Center for uh, the Arts in Society in the Netherlands and the current president of the International Society for the Study of Early Medieval England. Professor Polk is a cultural historian of early medieval England with a background in medieval history as well as language, English language and literature. The common strand in his research is gaining an understanding of Anglo-Saxon culture and of how modern generations have interacted, um, uh, have inter interacted with this early medieval heritage in both scholarship and popular culture. And um, I should perhaps at this point share my screen with you. Um, Um, Professor Polk is uh, the author of Old Age in Early Medieval England, A Cultural History, a monograph published uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Studies series in 2019, also numerous papers on um, early English culture and language published in academic journals, edited and co-edited volumes. Many of these publications are available in open access via his personal website, you can see the link to the website uh, on the slide below the title. My brief introduction does not do justice to Ty's diverse research and academic endeavors and his various efforts to pop popularize the field of research and his interests, not only through scholarly publications and conferences, but also by reaching out to a wider global audience through radio and uh, television interviews, a blog and a YouTube channel. The home site introduces Tice as a scholar of Old English, Tolkien, and Early Medieval England. And it is in his capacity as a scholar of Old English and Medieval England that he is going to talk today about fragments of an Old English glossed Psalter. The title of today's talk uh, has been slightly modified uh, in the course of last months, and it is now a treasure trove in the binding of a thesaurus, a sneak preview at some fragments, sorry, at some new fragments of an old English glossed Psalter. Thais, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, thank you for having me and thank you for this format, which allows me to, to talk for quite some time. Uh, I hope I, I won't be boring. Uh, I have made some slides, which I, I think will um, at least enliven uh, some of what I will have to say. I'm going to share my screen uh, and share the right screen, which is screen number two. Uh, there we go. Can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. And they're full screen and they're good. Um, so uh, again, thank you, uh, Monica, for, for, for having me and thank you to all the organizers for, for setting this up. Uh, I've certainly enjoyed um, the, 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 the lectures in this series that I've been able to attend. I've learned a lot more about Psalms um, than, than, than I did before I started looking at these series. 
Um, and today I want to uh, talk about my meeting with a with a Sam uh, or with a sorter rather, uh, and that is uh, a sorter I met inside the binding of a thesaurus or a, a Greek dictionary rather. Um, and it's a, a sneak preview at some new fragments of Nolings Plus Salter. So um, a publication is in the pipeline, as they say, and you're getting a sneak preview at, um, at what I found in that uh, thesaurus. Um, right. OK. If all has gone well, you should now see my outline slide, in which I'll inform you what it is that I'll, I'll do to you in the next 40, 45 minutes, potentially. Um, so I'll start with a very brief introduction to all these gloss sorters. Uh, I know that most of you know a lot about psalms and sorters, um, but the all these gloss sorters is uh, a unique category, you might say, or at least it's a category that, that requires some introduction. So I'll talk about that, uh, and then we'll move to the uh, newly discovered fragments of an all these gloss sorter uh, inside that binding of a thesaurus. Um, so I'll, I'll show them to you. Uh, I'll point out some distinctive features of those fragments, uh, and then I'll try and contextualize uh, those new fragments by looking at how they are connected to all these gloss sorters that we already know. Uh, and I'll conclude with uh, some words about provenance. Uh, where does that sort of come from, and how did it end up in a uh, book binding, which is currently in the Netherlands. But we'll start uh, with the Orleans Gloss Psalters. Now, I don't need to tell this audience that uh, the Psalter was an important document in the Middle Ages. It was um, a text that was widely read. Um, of course, all of these nuns and monks had to read the Psalter and the Psalms on a daily basis. Uh, but as uh, Alderic uh, Blom points out in his excellent book, Glossing the Psalms. Um, the Psalter was also an educational text. It was uh, an educational primer. It was one of the most studied texts of the Middle Ages, uh, and it played a role in education as well. And one way in which we can we can see that uh, uh, is the fact that many times or often these Psalters could be glossed either with an explanatory gloss or simply a linguistic gloss, uh, providing a translation of the Latin words uh, into a vernacular language. Uh, Aldrich Blom's book uh, deals with uh, various vernaculars in Western Europe, including Old English and also uh, Old Frisian and, and so on. I uh, highly recommend it. I, I will be looking at, uh, at Old English glosses to Psalters uh, in particular. Uh, Old English, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that, uh, is the English vernacular of the early Middle Ages. So it's spoken roughly between 450 and 1150. Um, and uh, we have quite some Old English gloss psalters. Uh, in fact, we have at least um, 14 of them. Uh, we know them by their... Uh, Initials, uh, we call them A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N. Uh, there's also an O, that's a very late Old English sort of with sporadic glosses. And we've also got P, which is uh, the Paris sort of which has a, a prose translation rather than a, an Old English gloss. Now, if you look at these Old English gloss sorters, um, I have a handout which has the full uh, shelf marks of each of these gloss psalters. Uh, I'll share that um, after I'm done talking. It has, it's just a handout with uh, a bibliography, so you don't need it now. Now, if you look at these all these gloss psalters, uh, you can already see that there's quite some variety in, in the manner in which they um, are carried out. So we can see that some of them come with rich illustrations, some of them are not illustrated, some of them come with different color ink, um, and so on and so forth. And I want to um, share some of the rich richness of these uh, various all these gloss, gloss holders with you. So I've, I've got some slides which show you um, how some of these sorters, they, they, they do the same thing, but they do, they do it in different ways. 
So they all give the Latin sort of rhythm all English gloss, usually interlinear gloss, so between the lines, but they do so in different ways. So there's some variation between these gloss sorters. Um, so for instance, the sorter on the left uh, gives uh, an interlinear all English gloss in a, a red ink. The Latin is in the black ink, and you can see that for every Latin word, there is an uh, individual Old English gloss. So we have nunc, which is Latin for now, and then you've got Old English nu, uh, you've got uh, dominum, and then you've got dricht or drichten, uh, lord, omnes, that's all in Latin, and eala in, um, in Old English. So that's a, a, a nice uh, interlinear gloss word for word translation of the Latin sort of text. Um, it's the Winchcombe Psalter or the C Psalter, as it's known. Uh, on the right, you see the Royal Psalter or D, uh, which has um, a different kind of gloss, or at least it, 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 it has the uh, interlinear Old English glosses to Latin words, but it also has some marginal explanatory glosses in Latin, which also appear uh, in between the lines. So you can see that that's a much more perhaps learned uh, work. It doesn't only provide uh, an Old East translation, it also provides some uh, ex explanation in Latin. Uh, here are two other uh, Psalters. Uh, on the left, we have the Vespasian Psalter, uh, and the really written in the 8th century, that is the Latin text is from the 8th century, uh, and then a later hand in the 9th century has added an Old English gloss later on. So you can see that again, um, an interlinear word for word gloss, but this time it was added later on by a different hand. Um, on the right, you see uh, uh, what um, what is a very planned out uh, Psalter, which is the Erdwinne Psalter, which gives uh, the three Latin versions of the Psalter side by side. So we have the um, Hebraicum on the left. In the middle, we have the Romanum. And on the right, we have the Gallicanum version of the Latin Psalter. Uh, and then uh, it is glossed in, in different ways. So the Hebraicum on the left is glossed with uh, some Anglo-Norman glosses for Old French. Um, the one in the middle, the Romanum text, is glossed with Old English glosses. And uh, on the right, that is the uh, Gallicanum Psalter, has uh, explanatory Latin glosses. So that's a, a completely different kind of gloss Psalter, uh, but, but it's still an Old English glossed Psalter. So again, there's quite some variation in um, in these all these gloss soldiers. Uh, a great introduction to the the old English soldiers uh, uh, is uh, this book called the Anglo-Saxon Soldier by uh, Jane Toswell. Um, she's also on the bibliography handout that I'll share at the end of the presentation. Um, just some more variation in terms of how uh, the the gloss is executed. Uh, so occasionally uh, a glossator would give more than one gloss, more than one translation of uh, a Latin word. So uh, for instance, on the left, you can see the Arundel Psalter uh, or H. Uh, and uh, for the Latin word dormitationem, sleep, uh, it gives three Old English words. So knappung, and then the abbreviation for um, for vel, which means or, uh, slap, or rest. So a nap, sleep, or rest. Um, I hope I hope those words are not necessary for you right now. Um, on the right, you see yet a different kind of, of gloss technique, which is found in the Lambeth Psalter, or I uh, gloss Psalter. Um, where you can see that uh, not only has the glossator added Old English translations of the Latin words, uh, they've also added dot glosses or syntactic dot glosses uh, underneath the Latin text. So, uh, for instance, if we read the uh, last bit of that sentence, uh, the Latin says psalom, 
Nomini Domini Altissimi, which is, I sing the name of the highest Lord. Uh, the Ulnis Gloss reads, Ich singe Naman Drichnes das Herstam. Uh, and then the uh, dots underneath tell you what the right order is uh, in the Old English. So you can see that each singer that has one dot, so that's the first word. Uh, so each singer I sing, Namon, the name, that's two glosses, uh, two points uh, underneath the, the, the Latin word. Uh, and then the next word is not Drichnes, because that has four dots underneath. Um, the next word needs to be das Herstam, the highest, uh, because it has three three dots underneath the Latin word. Um, so in all things, you would have said, ich singe Naman das Herstam Drichnes. And so the, the dots provide you the, the correct word order, if you like. So I sing the name of the highest Lord, rather than I sing the name of the Lord, the highest. That doesn't make any sense in either old or modern English. Right, so there is variation uh, in these old English glossophers. And the, the fascinating, um, the earlier title of this paper was towards a typology of old English uh, glossing techniques or whatever, because I thought this is so fascinating. There's such a big variety in, in, in how you can gloss things. Um, someone needs to make a typology. Um, but that was a... Uh, uh, that was too ambitious for the time frame and my workload. So that's why I've changed the title. I've changed the nature of the talk. Um, but in keeping with the, uh, the, the, the highlighting of the variation of these uh, Old English Gloss Sorters, um, I'll just point out uh, some more variation. So uh, we've already seen that uh, these gloss sorters may differ in terms of how they decorate the manuscripts, how they present the text on the page. We've seen different glossing techniques. Um, what's also interesting about these all these gloss sorters is that the all these gloss can differ depending on dialect, depending on, um, on, on the time in which the gloss was made in terms of word choice and so on and so forth. So to demonstrate those three points, those three last points, I've taken uh, the same psalm verse, psalm verse uh, and then I've looked at four different Old English source sorters and see, see what happens. So the psalm verse is, you are truly the same and your years will not fail. Uh, psalm 101, uh, 28, according to the Vulgate Reckoning. Uh, the Vespasian Psalter uh, translates this or provides this gloss. Thu soth lichese ilka earth, and yer thin ne springath. The Winchcombe Psalter gives a similar kind of uh, translation. So thu soth lichese ilka earth, and yer thin ne ateoriath, ateoriath. The Royal Psalter does this, and the Lambeth Psalter does this. Now, uh, philologists. Of course, uh, uh, love this kind of stuff because you can compare these uh, different glosses to this same um, Latin line, uh, and you can see all sorts of differences, and these differences are interesting. Um, so, for instance, uh, we can see that uh, the Royal Psalter, for instance, does not always gloss common words like who and autem. Apparently, uh, the glosses have thought, well, I've, if you don't know, what the Latin word tu means by the time that you get to Psalm 101, uh, you're doing something wrong. So I'm not going to translate tu for you anymore. So you can give a gloss for that. And the same goes for autem. So that's one difference. What, what words do you gloss? What words don't you gloss? Uh, I'll try and keep the all these linguistics to a minimum. But I will point out that uh, some of these all these glosses also differ in terms of, in terms of dialect. So the Vespasian sort and Winchcombe sort are, give a dialect form of the word yer, uh, which is the Mercian dialect form. Uh, in the royal sort, we can see the West Saxon dialect form uh, with palatal defongization, yer. So that's a dialect difference. Um, of course, what we can also see in these all these gloss sorters is 
the Old English language changing over time. So uh, in the Vespasian Psalter, the Winchcombe Psalter, and the Royal Psalter, uh, we can see that the, the word yer, yer, uh, has an unmarked plural form. That is according to Old English grammar rules, if you like. Um, so it's a, uh, because that's, that's what yer should do. Um, but in Lambeth Psalter, you can see a later form, uh, which is influenced by analogy. It has the S plural uh, like it has today. So today we say years. So the Lambeth Psalter uh, version of Ani being Yares uh, already is looking towards modern English years, if you like, whereas the other three Psalters do it according to the Old English grammar ways, as you would get in an introduction to Old English. Uh, finally, what we can see is that these four Psalters differ in terms of how they pick the, the words which they use to translate certain Latin terms. So uh, we can see a difference between aspringaf, ateoroth, yeteoroth, and ateoroth, teoriaf. Oh, um, so that's also something that these that makes these gloss sorted interesting. They differ in terms of the translation choices that they make. Okay. Um, now, the, of course, it, once you have uh, different versions of the same text and they uh, differ in some respects, but they are also set very similar in other respects. Uh, what we like to do is make stemmas uh, and, and, and think about the relationship between these gloss psalters, uh, which according to Philip Pulciano is, is on a lively discussion. Um, and it's, it still is. People are trying to figure out how these various gloss psalters relate to one another. Um, and, and generally, we, we do the same between an A tradition, a D tradition, and an I tradition. Um, uh, and again, these, these letters refer to um, the, the, these 14 Old English gloss psalters, if you like. Uh, and people try and come up with stemmas. Uh, that's usually uh, very difficult to do because there likely were a lot more Old English gloss psalters. Uh, than the ones that we now have today. So the, we're missing lots of intermediate links, if you like. There must have been hundreds of these Old English Gloss Psalters. And so drawing direct lines between the 14 that are available to us today is very difficult. Okay, so that was a, a brief introduction to uh, Old English Gloss Psalters. Uh, now let's go to what well, why, why some of you may be here which is uh, the sneak preview at some new or newly discovered um, fragments of an Old English Gloss Psalter. Um, so how, how I met an Old English Gloss Psalter. Uh, it started with an email. Uh, I got an email, the kind of email that people dream of getting, which is uh, an email which uh, pointed out that they had found some fragment of Old English in an archive, and they sent along a picture. So this was the picture I received um, in an email. Uh, and, and they said, well, this, we think this is Old English. We can't read it, but perhaps you can. And then I thought, my moment has come. <laughs> this, I, I, I can read this. Not only can I read this, I can also already tell that this is sort of 11th century um, judged on, on the script, uh, and I can, I can clearly see that this is indeed um, Old English. And so I said, okay, that's interesting. You, you found some Old English in a book band. Um, I'll come over. Uh, and so I had to go to Alkmaar, which is a, an hour by a train from Leiden. Uh, and they said, well, we found it in, uh, in a volume, which is part of a four, four volume set. And so I said, okay, that's interesting. Please bring out the other three volumes. Uh, and, and they did so. And it turned out that in each of those um, big folio sized uh, volumes of uh, what turned out to be a Greek dictionary, uh, there were fragments of, of an Old English lost Psalter. Um, this happened uh, early 2020, 2022. So, uh, 
little more over a little more than a year ago. Since then, I've been obsessing about these uh, fragments and trying to figure out what what they say and what they mean. Um, and I'll take you along uh, the ride. So one of the first steps, of course, I need to do was to figure out how these various fragments, these are spine linings, so they were on the spine of of this uh, Greek dictionary, how they fit together. So, so try and piece this puzzle back together. Um, so here you can see five spine linings that give the text of uh, Psalm 43. Um, here are two end leaf guards, so the, the things that are at the start of the book, uh, and they give parts of Psalms uh, 86 and 85. Um, I was even able to reconstruct one entire bifolium uh, using five of these end leaf guards. The only thing that's missing is an empty uh, upper margin. And so uh, what I stumbled on then is, uh, is a treasure trove uh, in the binding of a thesaurus. So uh, in all, there were 21 fragments belonging to um, an old English called Psalter, uh, 18 of which actually had text. So there were three which were uh, disappointingly empty and devoid of text. So the, the next step then, of course, was to uh, figure out, okay, what, what Psalms are we dealing with? Uh, what kind of sort of text? Well, it was 11th century, so um, the, the, the sort of text you would expect is a Gallican Psalter, uh, and that was indeed what, what it was. It was a Gallican Psalter rather than a Romanum uh, Psalter. Uh, and it had the text of, of these Psalms. I won't, I won't list them all. Um, and uh, it turned out to be uh, complete or partial all these process to uh, more than 500 Latin words of the Gallican Psalter. So quite, quite a lot of, um, of old English glosses. Okay, um, the next thing you do, of course, is, is look at some distinctive features to figure out um, when, when was this made, um, uh, where, by whom, and so on. Uh, and well, the, the Old English gloss is clearly an English vernacular minuscule. Um, the Latin rubric is an unsure script. And the Latin psalm text uh, allows us to date the manuscript to around uh, the 11th century. So it's an anglo caroline style four uh, with distinctive ra ligatures, which means that uh, it, it was likely written around 1050. Uh, so you can see the distinctive uh, ra ligature uh, right there in opera, this sort of weird R attached to an A. Um, is rather distinctive. Um, another distinctive feature is, is how the text is represented on the page, so the mise en page, as we like to call it. Um, you can clearly see that it has initials in red, blue, and green, uh, alternating, not, not in a systematic way, but sort of random. It has a writing frame of, uh, of, of this, <laughs> um, and it's ruled for 17 lines of Latin text per folio, which if we compare that to uh, other Old English Gloss Psalters is uh, rather luxurious in terms of, of how much text goes on on the page. So there's um, usually you have more lines per folio. Uh, and it has a distinctive three point punctus versus at the end of verse lines. Um, I'll, I'll get back to all of these features because they, they'll they'll turn out to be really relevant, um, but, but more on that later. So I'm going to keep you in suspense a little more. But do remember all of these uh, little little uh, details. Um, another distinctive feature is the fact that it has musical annotations in a later hand. Um, so it, here you can see uh, some Anglo-Norman neumes, or at least 12th century neumes or 11th century neumes, um, some musical annotation. Um, on in the right hand man, margin. Um, some language things. Of course, you also look at the language. Once you've done the text, you start analyzing uh, the language. So uh, it's clear that this is a, um, 
a typically late West Saxon text. Uh, it has powerful diphthongization. Uh, there's breaking of a ah before the u, uh, so eala rather than ala. Uh, and there's absence of angian smoothing. It's bezeoch and not bezoch. Um, there's some uh, non West Saxon and archaic forms. Um, I'm just uh, telling you this for the linguists in the room. Uh, if, if this doesn't mean anything to you, just gloss over it. Um, and there are some occasional errors in the text. So, uh, for instance, we can see that for a uh, verputibus, uh, rather than giving the accurate Old English translation, which would be magenum, uh, described accidentally, sort of, uh, switch around the N and the G. And so it, he, he glossed ma manegum, which means many. <laughs> Apologies for not giving you the, the proper modern English translation between brackets there. Um, so many uh, for rather than a magnum, which is virtues. Um, more dramatically, perhaps uh, we also have a, a mistranslation of the Latin. So, uh, in conspectu suo uh, is translated as on jesichte dina. So, uh, suo is mistranslated, um, uh, and apparently the, the scribe or the glossator or the, um, the gloss represents suo. Um, your, um, but that's inaccurate. Okay, um, so that's that's this this new, uh, new newly found fragments. Uh, um, the next thing you want to do, of course, after you've uh, looked at the text, try to figure out how these fragments fit together. Uh, after you've analyzed the text, what you want to do is, is figure out how does that fit with all of these other all these gloss orders that we already know. Uh, and that's when you get into the uh, inferno, uh, the hell of making a collation that is comparing these 14 other all these gloss psalters uh, to the uh, newly found fragments that you have. So for every Latin word or phrase, you try and find out what do the other all these gloss psalters uh, give. So for uh, ex inferno, uh, we have. Uh, of Hella in our Othmar fragment. Uh, but as you can see, that uh, uh, of Ohella is found in G, of Hella is found in all the other Polish soldiers. Um, Hella of is found in E. Um, you can see that for Vara uh, Niodheron, uh, there's lots of alternative forms, right? And that allows you to sort of place that new fragment within the context of these other existing Old English Gloss soldiers. Uh, what you end up with is a long list of uh, forms and how they differ and correspond to one another. Um, I, I won't go into much detail. In fact, I'll just summarize this really quickly. Um, I can tell you that the gloss in these Alkmaar fragments is close to F and G, uh, but it's a direct copy of neither. It's also very close to D uh, and to H and J. And again, those... Um, Letters refer to these existing all these lost soldiers. Um, and just to, to prove my point, uh, I've made screenshots of my lists of, uh, um, of places where the Ogma fragments follow G but not F, uh, where they follow F but not G, uh, and where they follow neither F nor G, but they follow D and H and J instead. Um, so, uh, here I'm just going to say, trust me on this, folks. Uh, the Ogma the fragments are close to F and G. Um, but also very close to D and H and J. Uh, got some very specific examples uh, to show you. Uh, so, for instance, D and Alkmaar uh, share some uniquely some unique glosses, including uh, one of these Latin interpretive glosses in the Royal Psalter in D. Uh, it's also found in in the Alkmaar fragment. So, for Sion. Uh, the royal soldier gave uh, a Latin interpretive gloss, uh, heavenly Jerusalem, um, and the Ogma fragments do, do the same. Um, it's not just uh, the glosses that you can look at and see whether they correspond to existing all these uh, gloss soldiers. Uh, you can also look at some of these distinctive features. So for instance, that distinctive three point punctus versus, 
uh, sort of the, the three points, the, sort of the, the semicolon and then a, a, a punctus. Um, at the end of verse lines is something that is not only found in the Ogma fragments, it's also found in, uh, in J. Um, so that's interesting. Um, what we can also see is that uh, the, the Misan Paj with the colored initials um, make the Ogma fragments rather similar to F, G, and H, which also have that same alteration of colored initials um, and to represent the text in a similar way. And so this allows us to place those new fragments within uh, something of a stemma. Um, so this is uh, a stemma that was uh, proposed by uh, Sizem and Sizem uh, in their edition of the Salisbury Psalter. And they pointed out that D, F, G, H, and J uh, share so many similarities that somehow they must be related somewhere. Um, and uh, we can now put our Alkmaar fragments inside that stem, either over here or over there. Um, so that's nice, but there's more to this um, because uh, other fragments of all these lost sources have been found. Um, the end Psalter is a fragmentary Psalter. Uh, and um, as you'll see, this has a bearing on the Alkmaar fragments that were found. Now, the end Psalter fragments uh, started popping up from the 1960s onwards. So uh, Dietz in uh, 1968 found some in Cambridge. Uh, Deole found some in Harlem, the Netherlands. Gnois. Uh, gave an edition of the Sondershausen fragment, which is found in Germany. And then uh, our host and organizer, co-organizer of this series, uh, Monika Opolinska uh, and, and two co-authors uh, published uh, a find, a very recent find uh, in, in a great article uh, in 2022, uh, which uh, presented us with fragments from Elblong, uh, Poland. Um, and uh, Gnois and uh, Deole and, and Opolinska um, point out that all of these fragments belonged, once belonged to the same N Psalter. And, uh, and again, I recommend that you read all of those articles. Um, and they came up with a number of features that all of these N Psalter fragments share. And if you, if you look at these um, features, you should uh, already start seeing that the Alkmaar fragments fit in really nicely. So um, the type of script is the same. Uh, the form and color of the verse initials is the same. Uh, the form of the punctus versus, uh, according to Gnois, uh, the punctus versus with the semicolon and the, the punctus of the three point punctus uh, is not a form uh, found frequently elsewhere, if at all. Um, it is found in all of these and sort of fragments and in Alkmaar and in the in, and in J. But that's it. Um, they also pointed out that the their N Salter fragments uh, had a close relationship to D, F, G, and H. So that also fits. And um, the, the ruling that they describe also matches the one that I found in the Alkmaar fragment. So that's, that's quite nice. Um, and there are further indications that the Ogma fragments belong to that same n uh, fragment. Uh, I'll just give you, I think, two examples. Uh, one is uh, three examples. Uh, one is that uh, both N Cambridge and Ogmar have musical annotations in a later hand. Uh, so that's not something that is, so that's another thing that they share, um, musical annotations. Um, some of the end leaf guards in Alkmaar match the form of the ones that were found in Harlem and Sondershausen. Uh, but most dramatically um, and, and interestingly, uh, the Harlem fragment and the Alkmaar fragment were cut from the same bifolium. Uh, that is to say, look. Uh, this is what the, that original bifolium would have looked like. There are places in the text where um, 
Harlem ends and Alkmaar takes over, and Harlem ends and Alkmaar takes over. So I'll, I'll show you that um, like this. So the red text is Harlem, the green text is Alkmaar, and you can see that um, essentially where Harlem ends, Alkmaar picks up, uh, and that happens uh, three times, as you would expect um, if they come from the same bifolium. Right? Um, so that's quite cool. Uh, the, the Harlem fragments and Ogmar fragments are definitely from the same bifolium, so they're from the same insult. In other words, those Ogmar fragments do not represent some 15th or 16th uh, Orleans glossed Psalter. It's part of the same insulter uh, that, uh, that uh, Dietz and Derole and Gnois and Monica Polinska uh, have already been uh, editing. So we have further pieces of the puzzle, right? Um, which brings me to provenance. So that, that brings in a completely different uh, angle, um, which is how does, uh, how do fragments of one and the same end sorter, one of the same sorter, end up in Cambridge, Harlem, Sondershausen, Elblong, uh, and Alkmaar? Uh, because these places are quite uh, far apart, as you can see, with the exception of, of Harlem and Alkmaar, which are quite close by, actually. Um, and to figure that out, of course, we need to look at the host volumes. In what kind of books were these fragments found? Now, sadly, for Cambridge, that host volume was not recorded. The same goes for Harlem, but I, I think I found it. Um, the same goes for Sonneshausen. Uh, but um, Monica Opolinska, uh, in their edition from 2022, um, note that uh, the host volume for those fragments was, was still there. And in fact, I think the, the fragments were, were still in there. Uh, and of course, the same goes for Alkmaar. And those host volumes can tell us a bit more about how these fragments ended up in these different places and, and why they're popping up now. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, I'll, I'll very briefly summarize what Opolinska et al. Uh, have said. Um, again, I would suggest that you read the article. It's quite cool. Um, they point out that these fragments that they found were used as end-leaf guards of a Hebrew grammar published in 1600, and it was owned by Samuel Meinreis, uh, a Polish gentleman, um, who died in 1604. So that gives us a nice window of 1600 to 1604. Um, intriguingly, Meinreis studied uh, here in Leiden between December 1600 and April 1602. Uh, under uh, Francis Junius Sr., who was professor of theology, who also taught Hebrew. So um, did Mein Reis buy his Hebrew grammar because he was studying in Leiden under Francis Junius Sr.? Who knows? Um, we do know that he defended his thesis on the Old and New Covenant uh, under the supervision of Junius on the 19th of January, 1602. So potentially that gives us a window of 1600, 1602. Um, but what about the Ogmar fragments? Well, they're found in a Thesaurus Graica, so a, a Greek dictionary, um, as end leaf guards and spine linings. Um, sadly, that book is not dated, except for the fact that it's probably after 1580, and it's not located. Um, so that doesn't really help us much. But um, luckily, uh, it was fitted with fly leaves, which had watermarks, which allow uh, us to uh, date the binding of the book to around 1600. So that's around the same time as Meinreis was buying his Hebrew grammar. Um, this book, this four volume set, once belonged to the public library of, of Alkmaar. And uh, fortunately, I, I found out that um, there is some documentation which tells us about the history of that book. Very long story, but I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly summarize um, by saying that this book was bought in Leiden around 4 June 1601. The patrons of the Municipal Library of Alkmaar, so the Libre of Alkmaar, uh, sent two people to Leiden to buy lots of books because there was a book auction uh, going on at the time. Um, and uh, 
these people went to Leiden and they bought lots of books, some at the auction, some at other bookshops. And this was uh, one of the books they bought, not at the auction, but at some other bookshop. So uh, Leiden, 1601. Uh, so that, that uh, brings us uh, nice to Mein Reis, who was a student of Leiden. Right? Now, I told you that uh, I found, possibly found the, the, the host volume of uh, the Harlem fragment, which is in the Harlem archive, uh, which happened to have a book with a very similar binding, uh, like the Alkmaar books, which is a, a limp parchment binding. Uh, it had fly leaves with similar watermarks, uh, and it matches uh, an item of the book auction of the 4th of June, 1601 in Leiden. So I think I may have found the Harlem host volume uh, as well. Um, and so that changes our, our picture uh, a bit about the provenance. So if I'm correct about the Harlem host volume that was bought in Leiden in 1601, the Alkmaar host volume was certainly bought in Leiden in 1601. Uh, the Elblanc uh, host volume was bought by a student who was in Leiden uh, between 1600 and 1602. Um, so I think we can add one more little mark on our map, which is uh, Leiden, uh, 1600. I think I've got five more minutes to go in case people are looking at the time. Um, so around 1600, this Psalter was in a Leiden bookbinders workshop and it ended up in various books and they ended up, these books ended up in various places. Um, but what about the manuscript itself? Where is that manuscript from? Um, we already noted that it has connections to D, F, G, H, and J in terms of how, what it looks like and, and the gloss relationship. And so that potentially tells us where it's from because uh, D, F, G, H, and J, according to an overview by Philip Pulciano, all come from Winchester or probably from just Winchester or almost certainly from Winchester, um, which, to me, makes it likely that the, the, the Alkmaar fragments and the end sorter probably came from Winchester as well. Um, this is a, cutting a very long story short. Uh, there are other opportunities or other possibilities as well, uh, as Opolinska et al. point out in their 2022 article. It may also be Exeter, but that's close by anyway. That leads me to a, a final question of, uh, of how an 11th century audience gloss sorter from Winchester ended up in a line book binders workshop around 1600. All right, so we have another mark on our map. Now there's a very boring explanation, which is simply that um, confiscated books uh, from England were shipped to the continent uh, for uh, book binders and soap sellers as John Bale um, famously points out. Uh, he writes about the desolation of the monasteries and how People will start selling off the libraries and the books. Um, and, uh, and he writes about uh, some they sold to the grocer and soap sellers so they could use parchment to wrap soap, uh, soap in. And some they sent over, to the, over the sea to the bookbinders, not in a small number, but at times whole ships full to the wandering of the foreign nations. So John Beale writes about how shiploads of English manuscripts were shipped to the continent uh, for bookbinders because they could use that uh, scrap parchment uh, as some sort of cheap material to strengthen their, their book bindings. That's, that's the boring explanation. And uh, there's also a, a, a more exciting explanation, which is, was first proposed, first proposed by Helmut Gnois, uh, and there's a much uh, better and fuller discussion in Opolinska at all 2022, and that is that uh, this sorter may be uh, the sorter that belongs to belong to Gunhild. Um, Gunhild was the sister of King Harald Gottmanson, uh, who, after the Norman conquest, fled to Flanders, um, and that she dies in Bruges in 1087 and leaves various treasures to the Saint Donatus or Saint Donas uh, community, including a sorter with all the English glosses. Um, which is described as the Psalterium Gunildis Expositum in Anglico, um, 
uh, in a library catalog from the 13th century. You can see that here. Um, it's the third item on, on this list. Now, the last witness to the Gunhild Psalter uh, was Jacques de Meyer, uh, who wrote a, a historiographical work about Flanders. Um, and he also writes about Gunhild ending up in Bruges, and he describes how she left the church of St. Donatus, among other things, a Psalter, which today we still call the Gunhild Psalter, certainly in Latin, but with a translation in the Saxon language, which no one here can quite understand. Um, so it, apparently by 1561, Jacques de Meyer uh, still knew about the Gunhild Psalter and its uh, illegible Saxon glosses. Um, now, Opolinska et al. Uh, uh, indicate or suggest that this Gunhild Psalter, which was never seen again, um, may have been lost when the church of St. Donatus was destroyed in 1804. We no longer have it. Uh, Chuck de Meyer is the last one to have seen it, or at least written down that he'd seen it. Um, but of course, 1804 brings us quite, is, is way too late for the, for the Leiden Bookbinders Workshop in 1600. Um, and there may be uh, another moment during which the Gunhild Psalter was lost, and that is the um, Calvinist takeover of Bruges. Uh, in 1578 to 1584. Um, in 1578, the Calvinists take over Bruges. And one of the things that they do is they found a public library uh, by confiscating books from uh, monasteries and churches. And the books of the St. Donatus community were confiscated on the 13th of December, 1580, um, with the purpose of either um, filling that public library. So the best books were to be taken from the uh, library to stock the public library. Uh, but the superfluous ones, so the ones that they couldn't use for the public library, they were to be sold. Now, if uh, there were more people like Jacques de Meyer who couldn't read the all these glosses, um, then I imagine that the Gunhild Psalter was one of those superfluous books that were sold off, potentially to a bookbinder who ended up in Leiden, who knows? It's all hypothesis, right? Uh, that brings me to my conclusion. What I've tried to uh, convince you of today is that uh, the 11th century end sorter likely came from Winchester. Um, then that end sorter, like Noyce has suggested and Opolinsky et al have, have, have uh, pointed out, could possibly be the Gunhild sorter, which was last seen in Bruges in 1561. Um, it ends up in a Leiden bookbinders workshop around 1600. Um, and fragments that were bound in various books end up in Cambridge, Harlem, Sondershausen, Elblanc, uh, and, Har and Alkmaar. Uh, and that's where we're finding them now. Um, now, lots of uh, uh, marks on the map. Of course, this is not the end of the story. Uh, the story uh, can be continued, and in fact will be continued, because there are still some of things that I haven't talked about yet, um, like uh, piecing these fragments back together, bringing them back, um, perhaps digitally, and perhaps looking at uh, what that insult may have looked like, uh, reconstructing it in terms of the bifolia and the folia and the, the choirs and how long it may have been. And um, I, I expect that this will be part of the uh, November lecture of this series by uh, Monica Opolinska. Uh, and I'm, for one, I'm looking forward to, to uh, hearing about the next steps. Um, for now, though, this is what I've had to say about those new fragments and my meeting with uh, an audience called Salter. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to read all of this, what I've said. Uh, in an article which is currently under review. Um, so hopefully it will be accepted and you'll be able to, to read it. I'll upload a, a handout for, with a, a bibliography in the Zoom chat. With that, thank you for listening. Oh, Thais, uh, thank you so much uh, for a wonderful talk. Um, when you started uh, and you, you know, reported on how you, how, how the whole story um 
you know, it was set up in motion, I couldn't stop smiling because the same thing happened to me. I got an email, um, uh, well, not from a librarian, from a colleague of mine who is, I think, actually present here at the meeting, Dr. Paulina Pludrajuk, and she emailed me asking a similar question. Look, I found these fragments amongst other fragments that I'm researching. Um, can you please confirm, is this old English or what is it? Can you help me? <laughs> and that's how it started. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, when you when we corresponded before this meeting, you said, um, I doubt whether you will learn anything new. That's not true. Uh, for one thing, uh, you know, it's, it's always, uh, it's always amazing to look at these fragments, especially if you are so, you know, emotional and close uh, to them as, as we both are. And uh, second, um, at least one thing that I somehow um, missed when I read your, uh, you know, uh, your your paper submitted uh, uh, right now was that um, uh, there is this fascinating uh, clue to the um, 16th century provenance uh, due to this Calvinist takeover of Bruges. So that that's a fascinating issue. And thank you for bringing that up. Anyway, um, since I'm a, a co-host, um, uh, I cannot probably at this point start asking questions. Uh, I have to uh, leave that privilege to other uh, guests and uh, the rest of the audience. So uh, I would like to open uh, uh, the discussion and the you know, question and answer uh, part of our meeting. Uh, so anyone who would like to ask a question is very welcome. And um, you can raise a, a hand, you know, you can click on this icon or you can just, yeah. Uh, Jane Tosman, please go ahead. We can't hear you. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm scared I'm going to lose my um, uh, connection, but uh, what what you guys are doing such fabulous work. It's just wonderful. And I'm I'm delighted this stuff is emerging, but two things strike me about it. One is that all of this material that has emerged is from one Psalter. So it, it was one of the things that used to be said quite commonly was, well, they were, a lot of them went off um, and, and and were lost somewhere on the continent. So I wonder if, if um, Tais, you might want to comment on the fact that it seems like one of them <laughs> went off and was lost on the continent. And, and then I'll I'll ask my second question later. Yeah, so you 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 imagine. Thank you, Jenny, for that for that question. So I, you'd imagine that if you find fragments that it doesn't belong to the same manuscript as as the other fragments that were discovered. That that's what are the odds, right? Um, and, and yet it is, <laughs> and and perhaps that that is a suggestion that that perhaps there weren't that many uh, manuscripts uh, or all these lost authors around. Or at least not many of them were were shipped off. To book binders on 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 the continent, um, and wouldn't it be extra super special if it was indeed the Gunhild Psalter, which would mean that it's this one Psalter that that we also have documentation about actually going to the continent? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, a, what are the odds? That that was my first thought. So I. Uh, I went to Harlem and I thought, okay, well, this looks very similar. And then I went to Sondershausen, which was quite far away. It was a long drive. Uh, <laughs> and then I thought, okay, well, this this looks similar as well. And 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 then I told Winfried Rudolf that I had I was I was in Göttingen for a conference, and I told uh, Winfried Rudolf I, I've been to Sondershausen, and he said, well, there's only one reason why you'd go to Sondershausen. It, it, it's a sort of fragment. And then he said, did you know that they found stuff in El Blanc? I'd, I'd never heard of El Blanc. Uh, but it turned out that uh, Monica and, and her colleagues had, had, had found fragments, and, and lo and behold, it's 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 again the same Psalter. It's it's remarkable. I, I have to admit, before Michael uh, speaks, that I I've always been a bit dubious about the Gunhild connection um, mm. because I thought it's one of those things where it would be so nice if it were true that you want it yeah. to be true too much, um, but. Um, certainly with the evidence that you've produced. And, and and I really like the fact that there's this, you know, concatenation of books about language right around the year 1600 and Myron Rice. I mean, that's just, that's just wonderful stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a, a quick follow-up to Jane's question, Tice. Great. It was an excellent paper. I, I really learned a great deal. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, one assumes when one finds these fragments and bindings that, um, you know, a book that was valued at one time, you know, has now been depreciated in its value and is simply being recycled you know, for some kind of uh, pedestrian mechanical reason, but there's a kind of subtext in your talk suggesting almost a sort of uh, preservationist impulse behind the use of these fragments in this particular book. And I know that's, I know that's counterintuitive, but um you know, one wouldn't necessarily assume, for in, <clears throat> for instance, that the person binding this book, um, you know, had the entire um, manuscript available to him. You know, perhaps um, perhaps he had at hand um, simply a fragment himself. You know, a few a few leaves from the manuscript and. You know, using the the strips and the in the binding in in a way, um, you know, has has preserved this this manuscript record. And again, I don't want to push that point too far because, you know, the the main purpose of of using manuscript um, materials in binding is um, is to you know simply support the the book being bound. But I wonder if you if you had any. Any thoughts about that? That kind of off the wall thought of mine. Well, so, so uh, um, yes. So many thoughts. Uh, on the one hand, uh, it is thanks to this bookbinder that that we now have these fragments. Who, who knows what would have happened to that manuscript uh, if it had not been cut up into pieces and 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 ended up in books that we can now open uh, or that we that we can now see. Um, so so on the one hand, it has aided the preservation. At the same time, uh, I, when I think of that bookbinder, I, I'm, I, there, there's a there's some fury and anger in me that he took <laughs> a knife or a, or a pair of scissors to that beautiful manuscript, um, and and I wonder whether whether he realized the so the the the, the manuscript the, the value of that manuscript that he had whether he realized that it was 11th century, um, it's it's. So I, I've been looking for that bookbinder, and he, he must have been in Leiden. And, and Leiden has many bookbinders, so there are about forty yeah. active around sixteen hundred. And I, I was talking about about this with a, with a colleague who's who knows everything about bookbinders, and he said, "Well, it's unlikely that it was a bookbinder that was affiliated with the university, because yeah. a bookbinder that's affiliated with the university would have realized that this is." a very valuable uh, manuscript around 1600 people like Francis Junius the Younger of course were were interested in old Germanic and and old English and they were actually actively studying all the faces of the language and so if a university bookbinder had a manuscript with all these glosses it's unlikely that he wouldn't have sort of tried to show it to to his professor friends yeah so, um I, I don't know whether so it was definitely not uh, the purpose of the book binder to preserve the manuscript, mm. uh, but I'm uh, yeah. so we we can be lucky that that um, that he, he put those fragments in the binder because now we have them. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yes, I can see that we have another question from Rafał Borysławski. So over to you, Rafał. Yes, yes, thanks so much. And thank you very much, Peace, Peace, uh, you know, for this, for this brilliant talk and, and, and really sort of an sort of exciting sort of who done it as it were. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, and, and, and sorry if this is sort of layman's question, you know, I've done no work really with manuscripts, but I'm wondering if it's possible to sort of follow the you know, um, the, the low countries as the kind of hub, you know, for this manuscript and think where perhaps potential other fragments of this manuscript um, may have landed. Yeah. I wonder if you've given some thought to that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's one of the next steps, right? So, so now, now we're zeroing in on, on, uh, on Leiden in 1601, there was a book auction 
What other books mm-hmm. were, were auctioned off around that time? Uh, who, who was binding these books around 1601 in Leiden? There's, there, there's a selection. So there's a select group uh, of, 40, of 40 binders. Um, I've been able to, I think I've located the, the Harlem host volume on the basis of the, the fly leaves and the watermarks and the fact that it's a particular lint parchment binding with a particular sort of, uh, binding threads at the top of the book. Mm-hmm. And so potentially, you know, once once you have all of these, well, it, it needs to be a limp parchment binding. It needs to have this kind of fly leaf. It needs to have these around this date. Then you can start, well, I would, I would say, rip them open and, and look at the fragments or find some other way of, of looking at the fragments without damaging the, the early modern book. Um, but yeah, there, there's now, I now have a list of 60 books uh, mm-hmm. in an Excel file but that I think may have some more fragments, but time, money, uh, give it to me and I'll, <laughs> I'll go and look. Fantastic. Yes, thanks so much. It's all the best with this. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. And if I may add to in answering uh, to Rafael's question, uh, there's also the repository left by my advice that has not been searched thoroughly yet. Uh, in the meantime, we have uh, found uh, uh, two more fragments, <laughs> mm. mm-hmm. and uh, we are we hope uh, to be able to go through the uh, Cambridge uh, repositories uh, later this year and also uh, look at the you know host volumes there. Perhaps we may find something promising. Well, amazing. Yes. Yeah. It's brilliant to be able to witness this. Yes, thank you. Yeah. It's a it's a wonderful experience. Yes. It, I can. I mean, you know, just sort of being able to witness this, you know, gives me a taste of that. This of how how great it must be for for you both. Thank you very much. Yes, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, and- right, I uh, switched off my microphone, but I was just uh, saying that. Uh, uh, we still have time for more questions, if uh, if there are any from from you. I'm just looking at uh, the list I'll of just, our... uh, I post my handout in the chat. It's just a bibliography and... Uh... Please do. And I can see that Jane um, has raised her hand, so over to you, please. I have a lot of questions, but I'm I'm going to ask the, um, the the slightly off the wall one. Um, in the late '80s and the early '90s, um, Christopher Holler, who worked on liturgy and lived in Sweden, um, and actually after him, Alicia Correa, who was at Cambridge, they talked about finding a bunch of old English bits and bobs, including Psalter materials, in Sweden. Um, and their 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 argument was that Vikings had wandered off with manuscripts and then chopped them up and were using them in bindings as well. And I, I just wondered whether this particular bit of gossip had arrived at either of your desks. Um, and be, and and yeah, well, I just thought I'd ask. No, that that sounds promising. Uh, I've never heard of it, Monica. Have you have you heard of these fragments in Sweden? I haven't, and I'm, uh, you know, eager to find out more. Could we ask for some references, perhaps? Right. You know, I every now and again, sort of about once a decade, I go running around Swedish materials, hoping somebody's published a catalog of fragments. Um, it's been a while. It might might be 10 or 15 years since I last tried, but I haven't been able to find anything. And, and I, I have a, at various times tried to find out where Christopher Holler's materials went when he died, and I haven't succeeded in that either. But both of you are probably closer to the ground, and you might have a better shot. Um, but it, it, it would also be useful to know whether this this was just sort of conference gossip, or whether there actually is something to be found. Uh, I suspect there is something to be found, but I also think it might actually be quite different from what you guys are finding, because the Vikings would not have gone off with, uh, well, anyway, the, the tradition would have been different, I suspect. Um, and so there might be interesting things. I don't know. Um, so, yeah, so I have no bibliography. I only have conference gossip and, and, and my own 
efforts which were unsuccessful at, at every time that I went looking. Um, but it's worth remembering about these uh, fragments, gossip or not, and, you know, have one's eyes open. Uh, perhaps we will be lucky, as we were with these, you know, uh, and sort of fragments. Who knows? It's absolutely amazing for me, you know, that they started um, coming to the surface in, in the last uh, uh, three years or so uh, in such unexpected places as Alblong. And, you know, Alkmaar is perhaps not that unexpected, given the provenance story, but Elblong uh, was really unexpected. That was really a surprise for us. So thank you, Jane, for, for this, you know, for sharing this gossip with us. And uh, we'll keep our eyes and ears open. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know if, if there are any other questions. Uh, Jane uh, uh, Roberts, Professor Jane Roberts, uh, is writing on um, a chat that Michael Gallick has been publishing um, a lot on fragments in the northern countries, but you probably know uh, all know that. Um, well, it's uh, a thank you for uh, uh, reminding us of that, and uh, you know, um, referring to to um, to his publications. Uh, I don't think that everyone here um, is working on Old English, so perhaps all, uh, uh, not all of these things are, are that obvious to everyone. Um, and we also have uh, uh, another message from uh, Professor Kuczynski, who says, excellent paper, Tice, thanks so much, got to run to another meeting, uh, very best wishes. Uh, thank you, and uh, we hope to see you next time um, in a month. Um, so, uh, uh, Thais, you said you would be sharing, uh, some, uh, references. Yeah, it's, it's, it's already in. So I, I said, I, I shared it in the chat. So it's, I think it's the second message in the chat. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So I can see. I wrote signum rather than signum apology. In the title. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that, um. If there are no other questions, um, and uh, the meeting is very slowly drawing towards the end, not yet there, so if there are questions, we still have some time. But if if not, um, uh, I would like to uh, thank Tice once again very, very much. I mean, it's, you know, it never ceases to <laughs> fascinate me, and um, uh, I could listen to it uh, um, uh, more than just you know for 50 minutes or so thank you so much it's it's uh, been excellent stuff and i keep my fingers crossed for your submission for your publication i hope to see it soon um and as you said uh yeah there is going to be a um a prequel you know further story um on this um uh, from me in november um but um next time uh, in june um we are going to have um uh something different so let me share my screen with you and invite you uh to our next meeting uh i can't yeah right it's here so as you can see our next meeting is taking place on june the 22nd and i very much hope that uh, magda hajinska buitik will then be with us again um uh, our uh, guest speaker then uh, will be uh, Professor Miros Miroslav Vrubel from John Paul II Catholic University of Lublin, and he will be talking about literary, exegetical, and theological aspects of Aramaic translations of Psalms of Pilgrims. Um, so a change of topic, a change of area, um, again, um, but I hope um, uh, that everyone who is uh, here with us today will be able to join us uh, in a month and everyone who missed today's meeting will join us too. Uh, Tice, thank you so much again and uh, I hope you will be able to come in June as well. Yes, thanks. Thank you very much, Thais, and thank you, Monica, and thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. All the very best. Please take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.
and we have more.